In this video, you will learn about the most efficient strategies of storing whole slide images for digital pathology. Hi, I'm Alexandra Zhurav and I'm here to help you do better digital pathology. If this is what you're after, be sure to subscribe and click the bell below to be notified every time I release new videos. Digital pathology images, whole slide images are big. Actually, they are huge regarding data. They can be as big as a two hour HD video on Netflix. And if we're using them for our work, there is often a requirement to store them, be it for primary diagnosis, for research, for any regulatory environment. We need to store this data, and this is a huge amount of data. So I invited an expert, Dan Lambert, the CEO of Pathology Watch, a pathology laboratory. He's a computer scientist by training, and he's gonna talk about the most efficient ways to store it and how Pathology Watch does it. And he was also a guest on my podcast, so I'm gonna link to the podcast in the description below. So if you have ever tried to send out a whole slide image per email, you have probably failed <laughs> because these images are very big. So um, people constant, but how? These images are very big, but people are constantly sharing them. They are working with them uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and there are more and more images produced every day. So how is this happening? And uh, so let's take an average hospital. How much data would that be? So I did a calculation once, and I'm gonna tell you about this calculation, but in a year, a hospital that is working with digital slides is producing 64 data that is equivalent to 64 years of HD TV. 64 years of data of, of HD TV in one year for a hospital. So um, how do they even calculate that? So if we take one slide, let's say a one slide that is at 40x uh, scanned a big piece of tissue that would be, let's say, four uh, gigabytes, four gigabytes. So four gigabytes is gonna be two hours of HD TV. And then you multiply it, let's say, by 5,000 uh, slides, and it gives you 64 hours, uh, no, sorry, years, 64 years of HD TV. So I was talking about this at the conference at some point and, uh, you know, trying to visualize or to show people how much data those slides have. And uh, yeah, people understood. And then somebody asked me, um, why are they so big? Why are they so big in pathology and not really uh, in any other uh, discipline? And I was like, oh, I didn't remember. <laughs> I didn't say that I didn't remember, but I, kind of gracefully tried to ask people from the audience to help me out. And today I have Dan Lambert with me. Dan is the CEO of Pathology Watch, which is a CLIA lab offering digital pathology services for dermatologists. And Dan was a guest of mine on my podcast. Welcome, Dan. How are you today? Great. Thanks, Alexander. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm going to be linking to the podcast uh, in our description below, but uh, I'm going to start with this question that the audience asked to me. Uh, why are whole slide images so big, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So in order to capture the, uh, the full resolution of the, um, of the tumors and, and the skin and everything else that we work with, um, these images are just have to be uh, huge numbers of pixels. Like we, we regularly see images that are, um, you know, 70,000 pixels by 80,000 pixels in order to capture the whole, um, the whole tissue area. Um, and then not only that, it has to be uh, displayed in a, um, in kind of a pyramid format because um, there, the pathologist needs to be able to view the images at one X zoom and two X zoom and then 10 X zoom, 20 X zoom and 40 X zoom. Um, and so you're dealing with this, you know, kind of massive image, but at, at uh, you know, it's typically seven or eight different zoom layers, and, and that just creates a mountain of data. Um, some techniques have been improving over time. Uh, you know, some scanner manufacturers, they're, they're trying to remove white space um, that doesn't have any tissue in it to make it smaller. There are certainly better compression techniques that are being introduced. 
Um, we process about 500 images per day in our labs, and, and we've managed to get the, the file size down to between 300 megs and about a gigabyte. But you certainly see tons of files that are, that are bigger across the industry, especially when the tissue is significantly larger. Yeah, so, um, okay, so it's like a pyramid and you, you cut it here and you have the low mag, then here and here and here and here, and you basically have not one image, you have plenty of images that gives us the possibility to like zoom in, zoom out. That's why they're so big. Um, and it's like, how do you store that amount of data? Uh, but like, why do you need to store it? Can't you just, you know, capture and, uh, get rid of it why yeah. is this being such a big challenge and you are working in the clear lab why do you need to store it yeah then that, then that's it's uh, because we are a clear lab and, and we actually do use um, digital images in clinical workflow uh, and so we have to be compliant um, you know we're having to store um, the the images and the glass slide um, for more than seven years um, we actually plan on keeping both indefinitely. Um, the biggest thing is to, is to realize that there's a difference between what you need to store in high availability storage up, uh, you know, up front, and then there's um, what you need to store in the long run that can be real low availability, maybe on tape storage or uh, you know, spinning disks or some, very, some much older form of storage that's very cheap but, but low availability. And understanding that you have to solve those two problems at once is, is, is pretty important for this context. Mm -hmm. So I work uh, in a GLP environment, good laboratory practice, and we also have regulatory requirement to keep the material that we're working with for evaluating our uh, tox safety studies for a certain amount of time. This is regulated by the protocols that we have, but I don't think it's less than five years. So it's like years of storing this data. Um, so basically regulatory requirements require us to store it for so long. So in the podcast, you walked us quickly through the process of the whole slide imaging image storage that you are using at Pathology Watch. And I found this tip extremely helpful for anybody who is starting even thinking of working, like really working with digital pathology, not just using it for illustration, but using it for their workflow. So what are the steps that you are using at Pathology Watch for storing your images? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first step is to um, take the whole site image that's been scanned um, on the local computer, which doesn't have, you know, it has only enough uh, disk space for maybe a day or two. Um, and move the whole slide image to, uh, to high availability cloud. Um, so you can use you know, any number of cloud providers or even a, um, an, an internal or, or wholly owned cloud, um, but you need, to, you need to move it to something that can be provided on demand. Um, so that's step one. Um, step two. Good question to step sure. one. Are there requirements for the cloud storage? Is it okay to store it in the cloud? You don't have to do like a proper server. It's okay to do cloud. Um, you need, you need to make sure that yeah, you need to make sure that you're following all of the necessary compliance around. If you're using any kind of public cloud, I mean, certainly AWS has HIPAA compliant um, cloud <laughs> options. Um, you know, a lot of organizations are enforcing both HIPAA and SOC two um, on uh, specifically on uh, if you're going to use any type of cloud environment for whole site image storing. Um, because that data has PHI, you need to you need to select into very very careful environments and not just use any you know any standard cloud provider. Okay, so HIPAA compliant and what was the other regulation? Um, and in, in many cases, SOC two compliance. Okay, okay, so basically compliant cloud. Okay, what's the next step? So the next step is um, to take a copy of that whole slide image and move it locally from. Uh, from the scanning computer um, to what we call cold storage. And, and cold storage is, it's basically a storage that's intended um, to not be accessed very often, um, but that can hold large, you know, large amounts of data. Um, you know, and so we, uh, we, we own and operate these, you know, 50 to 100 terabyte plus um, cold storage boxes. Um, and those just have, uh, the, you know, they're, they're uh, what are called RAID arrays of just hundreds of hard drives um, that are very, very cheap on a per unit basis. And their job is just, to, is, is just long-term storage. 
Um, and so we, we keep that there on site um, so that if, it, if something has to be accessed, we can go access it. But um, the cheapest options usually for cold storage are almost always local um, instead of paying for a cloud provider to keep all of that long-term storage. Mm -hmm. So you do go to like a physical device that you have on premises where you put those slides after the cloud. How long do they stay in the cloud? How long do you keep them there? Yeah, they're, they actually live for a very short period of time in the cloud because that, that high availability, high access storage, um, it, it costs, it, there's a lot of cost premium to that. Um, and, and part of the reason why there's a lot of cost premium is that we're trying to buy as much speed as possible um, out, of, you know, at, at, out of delivery of these images. And so you need to pay for the very highest um, availability tier. Um, but it, because that's so cost prohibitive, um, you, you, we try to um, get those images off of the servers within a couple of within a couple of weeks. Um, and so, if you uh, if you think about what we're doing, is we're moving it temporarily to high availability storage, making sure everyone can do their clinical work, um, and then immediately deleting that off as soon as we can. Um, part of the reason why that high availability storage is so expensive is that we're using something called a, a content delivery network or CDN, um, where uh, the, store, the images are actually stored in multiple locations, multiple server locations across the US, so that regardless of where the pathologist or, or any technician is looking at this image, we're pulling images uh, from high availability storage that's hyper-localized and can pull from multiple locations. This, this makes the viewing process much faster, but certainly comes um, at a cost in terms of like real dollars. And so we're trying to keep it in that, in that position for a very short period of time, um, typically less than two weeks. So that's like very high availability. Yes. <laughs> and it, so you have multiple copies of the same image because they're then stored in different places, whoever, whichever place is closer to the person looking at it, um, this is where it's retrieved from. Yes, exactly. Which actually gets to the third step, which is really important. Um, we, uh, because because we need to deliver these images in you know, in milliseconds, um, we uh, we break these images into tens of thousands of tiles uh, that that mm -hmm. can be delivered, you know, on demand to the to the browser. Um, and what what we found was that it's uh, it's really fast to go ahead and pre compute. Um, the top layer or two of that pyramid that we talked about. So up front, you know, breaking breaking those down into images that are, are already stored um, and and ready to just deliver to the browser on demand. Um, and then, but then when the doctor uh, views deeper into the pyramid, um, then we're then we're dynamic. We're doing more of a dynamic image pull. Um, and so this this really matters of how we do storage and that we're uh, you know we're storing tiles for the top for the top two layers in a in a distributed network. Um, and then pulling more images on demand in, in kind of the, the lower layers. And that, that allows us to control both the availability and the cost at the same time um, while figuring out that optimal equation between what needs to be pre-computed and then what needs to be computed on the fly. And this is, this by the way, it's, I mean, it's pretty groundbreaking in digital pathology. We don't, you know, we don't know of any other company that, that's done this yet um, to, to kind of figure out this balance of pre-computing and dynamic loading. The good news is all of this is resulting in really, really high availability storage. Okay, so uh, second for me to understand. So do you, in the multiple location, is this just the top of the pyramid or do you have everything in multiple locations? So in the multiple locations, we, we keep primarily um, just the top two layers. And then as a physician okay. zooms into the bottom layers, then we're dynamically pulling usually from uh, from just one central location. Okay, but it gives the, the system enough time to like localize what is gonna be viewed in the next, I don't know, couple of seconds. Um, yeah, okay. that's correct. Yeah, the, the top layers give a, you know, the top layers automatically load and give us enough time to dynamically load the, the bottom layers that are, you know, that are going on. Oh my goodness, I had no idea this was possible. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing this. And if you are finding value in this, please be sure to drop a like, hit the like or whatever you do on YouTube to tell us that it is valuable. Yeah. So what's the next step? Um, so the next are step. Yeah. The, the next? No, the next step is making sure that, um, you know, making sure that the image is viewed. 
Um, so once an image is viewed, then we, we leave the image available, available for a, a short period of time. Um, and then we delete the and then we delete the image because of, of several days after the initial read, it's very rare for a pathologist to need to go back once they've once they've made the diagnosis. Um, and so we're uh, you know we're rapidly deleting um, those images off the high availability again to keep the to keep the cost under control. Um, the the next step, which is also equally important, is that, that it, in case there's any reason for us to need to go back and retrieve an, an image. Um, then we're going back and pulling it out of cold storage, but that's a you know that's a fairly expensive, tedious process, um, and so we need to you know we try to make sure um, that we only pull from cold storage if we if we absolutely have to, mm -hmm. um, and that that if allows us to retain to. the original whole slide image um, while uh, while still delivering like fast results to the browser, and then just quickly cycling those uh, those images on and off of our our, our high availability storage. And did you have to retrieve it from the um, low availability? Did you have cases? How many cases? It's, you are yeah, it's how very, many in operation? Like yeah, it's very rare. Um, uh, I'd say maybe since the beginning of the company, we've, we've maybe had just a couple of cold storage pulls. Um, but when we do have to, it's a you know, it's a um, it's a fairly extensive uh, process, and so we just we, we try to avoid that whenever possible. Mm -hmm. I can imagine maybe I don't know second opinion or. I don't know, court cases or things where you actually have to retrieve it, um, that would be the case. Yeah, absolutely. The, so legal reasons, um, you know, if, uh, like CLIA inspections might require, you mm -hmm. know, historical images, image polls, um, you know, or just, uh, or just like, oh, there was a diagnosis or a misdiagnosis and a couple of years later, somebody needs to get back and access that image. Um, you know, there's also for some case for some cases there's just the possibility of just rescanning the original slide because we keep the glass slide as well, well um, and pathologists always have access to the glass slide um, also just you know just in case. Um, but the the data is there in case we need to retrieve it. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much for explaining this, and uh, thanks for being my guest. I'm gonna link the description to our podcast in the in the here video description where you talk more about pathology watch here within really talk about this because I wanted to dive into those things that I thought were super valuable for people who are starting in digital pathology and if you are still with us at this point of the video I think you're awesome uh, so be sure to check those resources thank you so much Dan thank you if you're still watching this video I think you're fantastic and you sure take your digital pathology seriously so be sure to subscribe to the channel and also listen to the podcast that I did with them to learn more about Pathology Watch and about the methods they're using to make their digital pathology experience seamless. Talk to you in the next episode.